Yes. Well, good morning. If we don't know each other, if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Ricky Echion. I get to be our creative communication pastors here at Gateway. Uh, and here at Gateway, if you are unfamiliar with us, we like to say that we love everyone life by life. That's our motto. But it's not just our motto. We believe it. And that means that you matter to us. So if you're joining us, maybe this is your first time, or you've just been checking things out, or you've been with us for a long time, we want to help you along your spiritual journey. All of you, as you walked in, you should have received one of these Life by Life booklets. Wave it in the air if you got it, like you just do care. Come on, there you go. Uh, so with this right here is amazing because this shows you every time you give here at Gateway, you are giving to a global impact. And I want you to open up that booklet and look at the things that you are helping partner with us and with God around the world. Y'all, these aren't stock photos. These are real people and real impacts that you are making in Burundi, in India, in, uh, in Africa. You are making a difference in Haiti and in the Dominican Republic. Come on, can you give yourselves a hand this morning? You can clap for yourselves. Your generosity is going a long way, and we want you to see that. So you don't just take our word for it. You actually see the difference that you're making around the world, and we are so grateful that you are a part of us, and you help do what God is doing in our city and around the world. And so this year, we want, to do, uh, we want to do it again. Last year, we said, hey, we want to raise $100,000 for refugees in our city, mostly Afghan refugees. And listen, you went above and beyond that. Like, you took us up on that challenge, and you went above and beyond that, and we were able to serve so many families. I love being a part of a church that says, hey, we want to do this, and everybody goes, let's do it. Like, it's so invigorating, so thank you for being a part of that, but we want to do it again this year. In our local uh, campuses and throughout our global partners, we want to raise over $100,000 across all of our campuses for what God is doing here in Austin and around the world. And you can visit uh, gatewaychurch.com slash life by life for more details if you want to see exactly what's being given and all of that. But we want to show you what your generosity has been making a difference and what it did in this year, 2022. In 2022, you, Gateway, gave $100,000 to the Love Refugee Project. Our goal was to serve 100 refugee families. Through your willingness to love, serve, and give, we far exceeded our goal. As we end 2022, we invite you to join us in giving and serving through the Life by Life Project to serve our global partners. Behind every dollar given is a need met, a community impacted, and a life changed. Isn't that amazing? That's what you all helped accomplish in this year. And that's just a small part of it. The truth is there's such a bigger picture that you are doing in our city. Uh, just this past couple of months, as a matter of fact, when we put out a charge, hey, we want to give gift cards to those in need to bring dignity. They, they can buy their own Thanksgiving meals and Christmas presents. You, across our campuses, you donated over 200 uh, gift cards worth thousands of dollars to those in need. You also wrote over 1,000 letters to orphans and pastors and families around the world. So thank you so much as just not you in here, but your kids as well who are part of the generosity that God is doing. And so we want to do it again. We want to go above and beyond. So would you join us in giving? Would you consider joining in giving? Now, if you're a guest here, feel absolutely no obligation to give. We just want this season to be our gift to you. But I know that there's a tension sometimes when you're giving to a church. You're like, I don't know what they're doing with this money. We want to show you what we're doing with your generosity, that God is doing something special and unique around the world through you and through your giving. So thank you so, so much. If you'd like to give today, you can go to gatewaychurch.com slash giving. You can give through our mobile app as well, or you can text the number on the screen behind me. It'll give you a prompt. It'll say your campus, depending on what campus. I know we have Tripping Springs here. We have South. Some of you go to different campuses on different Sundays. You can choose your campus, and you can go to Life by Life. So this is above and beyond what you may normally give. If you were a normal tither, for example, this is above and beyond that. This is separate. So pray on it and say, God, what do you want me and my family to give this year above and beyond towards this $100,000 goal to see lives change? Can I tell you this? It's not just about money. It's, in fact, it's not about money at all. 
We believe that behind every dollar, there's a face, there's a life, there's a family, there's a community that is changed, that is impacted because of your generosity. But it takes money to move it. It takes money to mobilize. So we want to ask for your help and your generosity. And we just want to say thank you ahead of time for doing that. Well, this season, we're kicking off a new series called Christmas Around the World. How many of y'all already decorated the tree? The tree is up. The tree's been up since the middle of November. Come on, raise your hands. Yeah, come on. I am one of those. I think we did it way before the, th- the turkey even thawed out. We already had the Christmas tree up and everything. Well, we're having this new series called Christmas Around the World. Make some noise if you were born in a different country, raised in a different country, or have immigrant parents like me. Make some noise. Come on. I know there's some of us. Yeah, yeah, make some noise. Uh, if you're anything like me, I saw the little Panamanian flag out there. I took a picture of it. I'm like super proud. Well, here's why we're doing Christmas Around the World. Number one, uh, we believe that when God came to the world, he came for all of us, not a select few, but for every single culture, ethnicity, language. And we wanted to celebrate the beauty of how the different aspects of Christmas show up in each and every culture and ethnicity and language. And we wanted to show and shine the light on the beauty of that. So we got together some gateways, and we had a meal, probably one of the best meals that I've had since I've lived in Austin. And we invited them to bring a cultural dish from the holidays. And we gathered together and we talked about how was Christmas celebrated in your culture? How was it celebrated in your ethnicity? What are the different things that your family did? And so we have all these videos that we're going to show, one, one video every week for the next four weeks. And we want you to see how the different aspects of Christmas show up in each and every one of our cultures. Here's what I found, that we are so much more alike than we are different. But there's beauty in our differences. And this week, as we talk about the light of the world, we t- ask the question, how does light show up in your culture? So I'm curious, how was light an essential part of your Christmas experience? Like, for example, right after Thanksgiving, uh, my family would put up the Christmas tree, put lights in the house, sometimes grudgingly, my dad would make me go outside the house and put them on. Uh, But what did you do uh, in your culture growing up? Growing up in a small town of the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil, most houses, they didn't really decorate with Christmas lights. So what we would do, we would take what we had, there was pretty much recycling bottles, and the whole city would decorate the center of the town together. So we would get what we had, get in community, and decorate. For me, growing up in Lagos, Nigeria, it's always, uh, for Christmas Eve, we have a candlelight service. Everybody gathers around, and uh, the whole light of the room is being turned off, and we light the candles, and we sing with our voice, with no instrument. It's always powerful. Wow, sounds like Wow, I love that. I didn't grow up in another country, but I grew up as a child of Indian immigrants, and so our church was really our family. And we too had light as a part and candles as a part of our church experience. And so four weeks before Christmas, we would begin the celebration of Advent, where we'd light a candle for each week, representing hope, joy, love and peace and then the final day on christmas day we would take all the candles and the priest would light the large white pillar candle which would be called the christ candle and then from that all the leaders of the church would go up and then they would light their candles and then they would go into the community and the entire congregation eventually all of our candles were lit and it was such a beautiful representation of how christ came into the world as the light of the world and because of him he made his light available to all of us so fitting that we're talking about Christmas around the world with the World Cup going on, huh? I know, I've been watching a lot of that. Well, as we dive into this Christmas season, we wanted to start from a different vantage point on the impact of Jesus' birth 2,000 years ago. So many times during the Christmas season, We focus only on the birth of Jesus, but we forget that this was God's plan all along. Jesus wasn't plan B, he was plan A. And this is a story that God was weaving before time began, that he's still weaving today. And it's a story, not only for a select few, but for the entire world. 
So over this series, we're going to look at how Christmas brought something new into humanity and how its beauty is celebrated differently across nations, ethnicities, cultures, and languages. Uh, Speaking of other countries, a few months ago, I had a chance to visit Europe and to go to Paris with my younger brother, Jonathan. And um, here are a couple pictures of me in Paris. You can see me and my brother at the Eiffel Tower. We had a great time. And while I was there, I learned a lot about Parisians and Parisian culture. For instance, I learned that Parisians love their cafes. I learned that Parisians will actually turn their cafe chairs outwards towards the street because people watching is such a big part of their culture. And I learned that Parisians are actually great photo bombers. If you see this next picture right here, you see that guy in the background? (laughs) Is that not the most epic photo bomb ever? I mean, look at that guy. Dude look like he in the FBI. <laughs> but Paris is a beautiful city indeed. And it's a city oozing with culture, history, and beauty. You may have seen images of the Eiffel Tower or know about the Louvre Museum. But what you may not know about Paris is that it's known as the city of light. Part of this relates to how Paris is, has a history related to innovation, and enlightenment. But the name also relates to how Paris is a particularly illuminated city. Paris was the first city in Europe, in fact, to be well lit at night. There are a total of 296 illuminated sites in the city. It contains shiny boulevards, This mic was too shiny, so I'm going to switch to another one. Give it up for our tech team and production team. There are a total of 37 bridges in the city of Paris. Or 37, actually, but 33 of them are illuminated in the evening. Even its famous landmark, the Eiffel Tower, has on it 20,000 light bulbs stretched across 40 kilometers of illuminated garlands. Paris is a city that is uniquely luminous, but it wasn't always this way. In fact, centuries ago, Paris was a city that was wrought with crime and murder. It was even considered the murder capital in Europe. So to make the city safer, lanterns were placed on almost every main street. And citizens were asked to place candles and oil lamps by its windows so that crooks and criminals couldn't hide in dark alleyways, thus reducing crime. Today, Paris is considered a beacon of light the city that shines for all to see. Indeed, Paris is a city that is filled with light. And, you know, sometimes the simplest things can carry such rich meaning. Across cultures, there are certainly elements that distinguish them from one another and that aren't transferable. For example, in one culture, you might greet each other with a handshake, in another culture, with a kiss. But there are some elements and truths that are valued and that are shared across cultures. And one of these is light and how it is important. As mentioned, this Christmas season at Gateway, we wanted to go through a series called Christmas Around the World, where we celebrated the beautiful expressions of various cultures and nations and how the story of Jesus was for the entire world. As you saw in the video before the message, we hosted a dinner a few weeks back where we invited people from all around the world who call Gateway Home. And what we learned there is that across cultures, there are a few transferable truths that we can all learn from. And the one that we'll be talking about today is light. 
there are different types of light and traits and qualities that make light unique. There's light from fire, which has been essential to humanity for thousands of years because it could be shared and it could be used to cook meals. There's natural light and artificial light. There's different types of light for photography, like golden hour or magic hour, which is the hour after the sun rises or before the sun sets that photographers love because it creates warm and stunning photos. Light can be penetrating. It can be powerful. It can also be soft and comforting. Like when I'm home alone after I watch a scary movie. I'm like, turn all those puppies on. Turn them all on. Woo! Light can enable us to see in the dark and to drive our vehicles at night to get from point A to point B. There are even songs about light, like look, Madonna's Ray of Light. And I feel like I just got home. Light plays a prominent role in celebrations and festivities all around the world, from the German lighting of the Christmas tree to the Hindu celebration of Diwali. Indeed, there are beautiful types of light in this world. But there's one light that is different from them all. And that light is a person. During Christmas season, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, who scripture calls many names, but one of those names and identifiers that scripture refers to Jesus as is the light of the world. John chapter 1 says this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Jesus' light was the light of all mankind. And if there's one thing that you take away from today, let it be this. Jesus' light not only shines in the darkness, but it overcomes the darkness. And it transforms the darkness. When God created the world, creation was first dark and without form. And then it says, God created light by speaking it into existence. This light brought a distinction between light and darkness. God creates the sun, the moon, the stars. And he did this to bring light into the world and to illuminate it. And God's introduction of light allowed for new life to be formed and for creation to take place and populate the earth. And when God, the master artist, was done creating, he stepped back, looked at his creation, and said, It is good. But after God created light and created humanity to walk in his perpetual light, Humanity chooses darkness. They rebel, choosing to disobey God, resulting in a metaphorical darkness that is now reinvited into the world. And as a result, darkness is now something that humanity has to wrestle with every single day. 
But you know what's beautiful about God? Even when we chose darkness, God didn't leave us in the dark. Because of how amazing God is, he chose to pursue us over and over again. And he sought to bring us back to the light over and over again. We see this numerous times in the scriptures. For instance, in the Old Testament, there's this story of a man named Moses. Moses encounters a burning bush. This miracle, this dynamic event where this bush is engulfed in flames but not consumed by it. God speaks to Moses out of the bush. Moses, Moses! Don't come any closer, God says. Where you are standing is holy ground. And eventually Moses, this runaway, is transformed into the leader of an entire nation. Later on in the Old Testament, God delivers his people, the Israelites, from Egypt and from Pharaoh. And then he leads his people by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night so that they can travel at night. And when we get to the last part of the scriptures, God introduces a different kind of light. This light was a man whose name was Jesus. This man wasn't like any other man, though. While Jesus lived and walked on this earth, he healed the sick. He made blind people see the crippled walk. He rose people from the dead. He called himself the bread of life. Through him, people were born again, not through flesh, but through the spirit. Jesus brought wholeness into the world physically and spiritually. He gave people a new name, a new identity. Jesus gave people purpose. Jesus and his light brought so much life into the world. Impressionism is a style of painting that I'm fond of, and that was developed in the 19th century. And one of Impressionism's distinguishing marks is this value of light. Impressionists, these artists, rebelled against the norm, and they would set up their easels outside, like in the countryside, instead of inside in studios. And instead of making these historical or religious or mythical paintings, which are popular at the time, these artists sought to capture images in real life, in real time, like capturing sunlight dancing on top of water. Impressionism changed the art world. It, in and of itself, produced several different art movements And it added so much beauty into the world. This art form that valued light brought so much life into the art world. Similarly, Jesus' light brought so much life into the world. A world that metaphorically speaking was dead and barren. Life was one that was in need of saving from the darkness. A darkness that led to death But Jesus introduces his light, his good news of salvation and transformation. When accepted, produces, he says, a well of living water that comes out of the individual's heart. In life, like we've never known it before. In him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. Jesus' light made a new people, a new humanity. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. 
Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy, says 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. The light of Jesus creates a new people who are called out of the darkness. And into Jesus' marvelous light. And these people are also witnesses of this light. When I first moved to Austin a few years ago, I feel like I had a bunch of people come up to me during the wintertime and be like, have you been to the Trail of Lights? Have you been to the Trail of Lights? This once a year event when the city of Austin totally transforms Zilker Park and turns it into this Christmas light, festive extravaganza. But they were like, have you been to the Trail of Lights? And I did, and, and it was crunk. It was awesome. We can get so excited about Christmas lights, right? Me too. I mean, I can be like Buddy the Elf during the holidays, you know? Maybe your family goes annually. <laughs> there it is. But maybe your family goes annually to see Christmas lights. Maybe it's a tradition for you and your family. Maybe you walk around your neighborhood or you drive around neighborhoods. Some of us are so passionate about showing others Christmas lights that we will hire people and pay them to install lights on our home so that others can pass by and admire their beauty. I wonder... If we could be just as excited about telling others about the light of Jesus. I don't say this to make any of us feel shame, but just for perspective. John the Baptist was someone who was excited about telling people about the light of Jesus. The scripture says this about him. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Again, John wasn't the light. The scripture is very clear about that. But he was a witness to the light. John wanted to tell others and show others this amazing light. Saul was another person who would later be called Paul who was passionate about telling others about the light of Jesus. He was persecuting Christians, but then one day as he's traveling, Paul sees this intense light from the skies. And out of this light, Jesus speaks to Paul, 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 why are you persecuting me? Jesus says. Saul goes blind for three days. And eventually, he's given these instructions. The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Paul was transformed by Jesus from this person who is murdering Christians to one of the greatest church planners missionaries, and evangelists in the history of this planet. There were even those who were excited about telling people about the light of Jesus as soon as he was born. Jesus' first witnesses were normal people, just like you and I. They weren't perfect. They weren't the elite. They weren't royals. They weren't of noble blood. You know who they were? A teenage girl, her newly wed husband, and lowly blue collar working shepherds. What do you think this shows us about God? 
the fact that he chose these individuals specifically to be his first witnesses. Have you ever wondered if God could use you in a great way? Have you ever wondered if God could use you to be his evangelist, to be his witness, to be someone who spread his gospel? Oh, no, not me. I, I, I can't tell others about Jesus. I, I don't have that gift. Nope. Uh, I, I'm not an evangelist. Nope. I'm not a preacher. I didn't go to seminary. So what if you didn't go to cemetery? I mean, seminary. That doesn't disqualify you. If a teenage girl, her husband, and lowly shepherds were able to be witnesses of the good news of Jesus, so can we. Because it's not about us. It's about God, who, by the way, wants to use us because of how generous and loving he is. Scripture says one day that angels appeared to these shepherds and informed them of some really, really good news. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Do you know what this means for the shepherds? They were the very first evangelist. And again, if these shepherds, these blue-collar workers, were the first evangelists and the first witnesses of Jesus, this means that we, too, can be evangelists and witnesses of the good news. We can be witnesses of Jesus' light and be just as excited about these shepherds, about this light as the shepherds were, rather. This light that brought joy and hope and this light that overcame all darkness. Jesus entered the world as light, but this doesn't mean that when he did so, darkness just went away from him. When, when Jesus entered the world, darkness isn't like, hey, Jesus, come on in. I'll get out of the way. No, it was quite the opposite, my friends. Jesus lived as a citizen in this world, just like you and I, fully immersed in its darkness. He was questioned by spiritual leaders, doubted by his family, his friends, tempted by the devil. But the darkness wasn't able to prevail over Jesus, Jesus over came the darkness. John 3 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Jesus came to the world and he came to condemn us. Not to condemn us, actually. He came to save us. <laughs> Jesus, what you doing? And what's amazing is that God, again, he's not stingy with his light, but he's made it available to all. Jesus wants to shine his light in your darkness. Uh, are you in any darkness right now?
You know, I've been sharing with our evening service here at Gateway South over the last few weeks that I tend to doubt myself a lot. You may be asking why? Because of childhood wounds and, and just tough experiences when I was younger. I've doubted who I am and seen myself as unlovable. And this has caused me to have a lot of dark days. But Jesus has brought light into my life. He's unraveled lies and through his word shown me the truth of who I am, that I'm his beloved son. And I'm here to tell you that he can bring light into any darkness that you are in. Maybe you're saying, why am I in darkness? Where, where is Jesus if he is the light? Even if you have no clue where Jesus is, if you don't see a trace or a hint of light in your current circumstances or situation, can I just encourage you that Jesus has not let you alone? In fact, Jesus is with you in the darkness. You see, a long time ago, Jesus, he left this place that was surely full of perfect, immaculate light and splendor. And he left that place and stepped into the world in its darkness. A world full of sin and brokenness. And why did Jesus did this? do this? For you. Jesus stepped into the darkness so that you wouldn't have to walk in darkness anymore, but so that you could walk in his perpetual light. And he gave up his life on the cross so that all of our sins and all of the sins of the world could be forgiven. And so that we could have new life in him. And he was raised from the dead. And if we just believe in him, just believe, we can walk in his eternal light forever. The city of Paris was once a dark city, but today it's known as a city of light and shines brightly. Similarly, the light of Jesus illuminates the world and unlike other light, this light produced life. It produced millions and millions of followers and witnesses. It overcame all darkness. The light is strong. It's not dead. It's alive. It's dynamic. It's powerful. And this light came to shine on you. We're going to go into a song where we want to give you a chance to reflect not on how Jesus obliterated the darkness of the world, but how he came to shine his light in any personal darkness you're experiencing right now. Maybe it's darknesses in your, in your marriage or darkness in your finances with substance abuse. I don't know, but take some time right now to reflect on how Jesus came to bring light not only into this world, but into your heart.